We're here with Cubs legend and baseball Hall of Famer, a man known as Mr. Cub, Ernie Banks. And Mr. Banks, it's great to have you with us. Thanks Thank so much you. for being here. Thank you. Nice to see you again. It's, uh, yeah, let's start, first of all, by talking a little bit about spring training. Uh, baseball players are back in Arizona and Florida. Cubs certainly back in Arizona. When you think back to your time in spring training, what's it like for baseball players as they reconvene to start another season? Well, it's just wonderful. I, I just feel funny about even talking about spring training, what it meant to me personally. I mean, you first time I went down, went out on the train, and I went past Mesa where we trained, <laughs> and they had to get off and they had to bring me back. I was so, <laughs> the train was just didn't stop. I, I forgot to get off. I stopped <laughs> at Mesa, but I forgot to get off, and it kept going. And they stopped the train and got me off. But I was so excited about getting the spring train, and it's, uh, Nice place, we're in Mesa, Arizona. The weather's always good. We had nice hotel facility. Uh, you get a chance to meet uh, all the players at the hotel. Then you get to the ballpark, and, and again you meet, and you know, you just kind of get familiar with each other, and uh, you start getting on the field, running, mostly running, a lot of running throwing, catching, getting in your position, and doing things that you would do during the regular season, but following the manager's guideline. So spring training is awfully exciting to me. How important is it to the success that the team's going to have during the regular season? It's, uh, it's very important, although it's not considered that because you play spring games, and we usually you know, win half of the games, lose half of the games. and. But it's, it's uh, kind of getting you in the feeling of playing and competing, and, and uh, you're more relaxed at that level of spring training. Uh, my kids came down. They went to school there. Normally, if your kids are not in school, they come down to spring training. They uh, go to school. They come to the park. You go play golf. I mean, it's more relaxed, and it's a relaxed atmosphere that I really, really like. I really enjoy spring training. You, uh, you do that for a while, then you have time off to go do things with the family, and then they start playing the games. And when you start playing the games, then you play a few innings, and you get out, and they put other players in, and the manager is looking at young rookies, how they do things, how they deal with competition. And then the veteran players more or less take their time, go out and run, and I really like going out to the outfield after I got out of the game and running from foul line to foul line. And, uh, you know, just, just getting your legs in shape and, and feeling good about your life. Because you, you get in shape and you're ready to go and, and uh, you don't want to see spring training in. I didn't. Because now most of the kids think it's too long. Well, let's talk a little bit about the Cubs season ahead. The slogan this year is year one, signaling a new beginning for not just a new season, but a new beginning under a new ownership group led by the Ricketts family and Tom Ricketts. As you look at the way this team is shaping up on field and off, what do you expect this season? I expect uh, a strong year, like every year with the Cubs <laughs> when I was there, that a strong year. Normally we get off to a fast start or a slow, slow start. Then we pick up, but we get to the All-Star game. Then we get a little bit better after the All-Star game in contention. And uh, after the All-Star game, you still start feeling the ability of the players. How good are we going to be this year? You know, the pitching, the, the hitting, the, the league itself and what they're doing against you. And uh, normally, in my history with the Cubs, if we only played seven in the ball game, we'd have won 10 World Series. Because <laughs> <laughs> usually the games are decided from seventh inning on. And you have to have good relief pitching back then and now. So that was a big issue with all of us. We had good pitchers starting out, played real good. Then we get past the All-Star game. Then we start getting to the meat of the season, and then past that, you get to the part where you begin to get a little tired. So you got to get fatigue a sets in. Yeah, you got to get a second win. And most of the other teams that we played against, 
knew we played all day games and that they felt that the hot weather was going to get to us. Stan Musial used to talk about that a lot. Boy, you're on the lead now and playing great and all that. You wait till you get to July and August. When it gets real hot at Wrigley Field, you all won't have it. You'll run out of gas. He was kidding about that. But, but we usually did. Yeah, you, do you, and you think there's some truth to that theory that the day games are harder on the Cubs than those teams that, that have more night games? Yes, you have to, you have to get adjusted to uh, the weather, which is day games, at Wrigley and, uh, and the games itself and the wind factors. A lot comes into play after the All-Star game playing at Wrigley Field in the daytime. Uh, and the wind blows out in July and August, September it blows in, blows the right field. You gotta deal with the wind at Wrigley Field a lot for the end of the season. And your stamina has to do a lot with it. A lot of us during this season, we didn't have lunch. You know, we, we'd go out in the morning, nine o'clock, take bat in practice, in field, and then we have to get off the field and come in the locker room, and in the locker room, we wouldn't have anything to eat. You don't have to get the energy. Then you gotta get out for a 120 start or a 1220 start. That's right, uh huh. So normally, my energy level changed about the seventh inning. But then we, we had a guy named Colonel Whitlow. He was a military guy that developed some drink, you know, a nutritional drink that we could drink during the time we would after we finished taking batting practice to give us some energy. And uh, it didn't work because many, <laughs> many guys didn't like that. They wanted to have a hamburger or something, you know, something a little more uh, substantial. But the big thing with the Cubs, and this is a secret, was that we just ran out of energy because we didn't, we didn't eat, we didn't have lunch. We went right into the game start the game, get around the seventh inning, and that's when we begin to lose our See, energy. Now we have the secret to why the Cubs haven't won a World Series in 100 years. It's because they don't have lunch. Is that what, that's what it boils lunch, down to. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have lunch, but the only guy that had the stamina was Billy Williams, Ron Santo, and in the early part when I came along and was younger, I had the energy toward the end. But as I got older, I lost the energy as the game got deeper into it. And uh, it's uh, it's it's amazing phenomena to go through that because it's playing an unusual area, unusual environment. Day baseball was different than playing night game. And then you go on the road and you have to deal with the night game. So your body get kind of jittery during the midday because you used to plan and you're not playing. So you get to the night game, and the night game we usually started out very slow. You know, because it's seeing the ball and just adjusting to adjusting, the, 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 yeah, the, the adjustment night game period. Itself. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. These are some of the things that I'd like to explain to the management about what I've experienced with this, you know, day baseball, although we plan a few more night games. We want more night games now. And they're trying to get that, although Wrigley Field is a landmark, so they have to get a lot of permission to do certain right. things with the city. Let's go back and spend a few minutes talking about you and your own career itself. But I want to begin during the earliest memories that you have of baseball. When did your love of baseball begin? Uh, was it a love? <laughs> I was trying to figure that out. Is this love? <laughs> is this a career? Or this fun? Or is it joyful? What is this? I mean, it's like going to Wrigley Field, like you're going to, uh, uh, you know, a park where, you know, people you know, it's friendly ballpark. When I played, we didn't have big crowds. We got to get the crowds later when we start winning. And uh, I knew a lot of the people, you know, that came early, you know, they opened the gates early. Sarah would come, 
Margaret would be over here. You know, you speak to them, they speak to you. We were very friendly with the fans because they came early. They opened the gates early because there wasn't many crowds. Then we had 20 to other people went on sale each day of the game. Mr. Rigley had that. So they would come later, but they were all people that we knew. I mean, they knew us, we knew them. And uh, it was uh, uh, friendly. Then we had to focus on concentration of the game, you know, signing autographs and speaking and talking about this and that. Then you got to play the game. So when we get in the game, it takes hard for us to get into focus, get up, focus on the game, plan the game. I read, and correct me if I'm wrong, that your father had to bribe you with nickels and dimes to play catch when you were a kid growing up. Is yes, that true? Yes. And, you know, that's why I didn't know how to answer the fact. <laughs> you love it? Or what, it, what does it mean to you? Because I played it. You know, I didn't want to play because it was before Jackie Robinson and my dad played and and what happened is uh, my mother was born in Louisiana so she believed in voodoo. You heard of voodoo? Yeah. So she talked my dad to take me to a psychic to find out whether I was going to play baseball or go to the army. So he drove me to across the county of Texas and met with this lady and she said that, uh, you know, he'll play baseball, he won't go to the Army. So my dad drove back, I didn't say anything, and he was just smiling, he was as happy as he could be. <laughs> but I did go in the Army. As well, yes. But I didn't take basic training. So I went to Germany, and I had a bad knee, and they had to put me in the hospital. And I stayed in the hospital for about three weeks with my bad knee. I don't know how my knee was that way. My, knee, my left knee got locked up. I couldn't straighten it out. So what the doctors did, they put weights on the end of the bed, and I stayed in the hospital bed and my weights on to stretch out my left knee. So that's the only thing they did was no surgery. But this visit to the psychic, this is when, how old were you? Uh, 14. And at that time, you were athletic, but you weren't focused on baseball. That's right. I at, didn't play sports. At all? No, I did not. And a friend of mine, uh, I was standing around watching him practice football, and he came over to me, hey, you should be out there playing. Go in there and get a uniform. So I went and got a uniform to play football my last year in high school and got hurt. I didn't care for sports at all. It was not one of my desires because in Dallas, they didn't have any that kind of opportunity. There was no minor league teams. Uh, there was a high school team that played each other football. And uh, I just didn't have any desire to play it at all. But he talked me into going to play football. I played football, got hurt. And uh, then I went out to Amarillo, Texas to play ba baseball, from softball to baseball. And then from there, I came back, and then Buck O'Neill saw me and signed me to a contract with Kansas City. Kansas City Monarchs, yeah. Negro Leagues. Uh -huh. When did you realize you had talent for this game? When did I realize? Yeah. I never realized I had any kind of talent. Come on. I did not. Because when I was with Kansas City, I didn't, I didn't hit any home runs. I mean, I just played shortstop. <laughs> And that was about it. And I learned a lot from the guys I played with, Kurt Roberts, and you know, guys that were playing on a team that went to the major leagues. But I never felt that I had any talent. And then in 1953, though, the Chicago Cubs clearly thought you had talent because they brought you on board. And you were the first African American player to hit the field for the Cubs. And I didn't want to go. And, and, and I understand that as well. Why didn't you want to go? because I was more comfortable in the Negro Leagues. I mean, the players that I knew, they were older players, uh, they were very friendly, uh, they told a lot of jokes on the bus and the clubhouse, and it, you know, it was just a fun, comfortable place. I just felt comfortable in that league and, and playing. I didn't do very much, but I just felt good about it. Then I became a roommate of Elston Howard. We came from St. Louis, and they put us together, and. And, you know, I listened to him. He was a little bit older than me, and 
And then finally he went to the Yankees. He went to Muskegon, Michigan, and he got into organized baseball, they call it. But I just felt comfortable playing in the Negro League. I really missed that. And I'm one of the few players that came out of a segregated situation with the Kansas City Monarchs to integrate it when I came to the Cubs. I was going from segregation to integration. And that was during the time that uh, the president did integrated the army and the military. And I went in the military and it was integrated when I went in. So my life has been that type of life. You know, I had to get adjustments from the Negro Leagues playing there to the major league. Now I come to the major leagues and, and Ralph Kiner, Hank Sauer, and all those guys were there. And uh, I didn't know what to do or what to say. <laughs> you know, the coaches were there. The manager was a plan manager. His name was Phil Calaretta. And I didn't know what to do. It was a learning process and learning how to get along, you know, with white players. And we were, we were riding on trains then, so you had more time to talk and socialize and all of that. I didn't do any of that. I came with a guy named Gene Baker. And I was always around him, learning from him. He had more experience than I did. So my whole part of my life was learning how to relate to another group of people. And I didn't talk. You didn't talk during the, much during those first seasons? No, I didn't talk. And what changed? Well, Jackie Robinson, we played the Dodgers for the end of the year after I came up. And Jackie came over and he came out early, I came out early, he was over on first base, I was on third, he came over and, you know, he said to me, hey, glad you're here, you know, listen and you can learn. That's all I remember, listen and you can learn. So I didn't, that's all I was there, listen and, and learn it from the other players. And that was it. But it was, a, it was an adjustment that, you know, I had to deal with. I live south, most of the white players live north. So we played together and lived apart. I didn't understand that. You know, and then you didn't ever have any relationship during the off season with any of the white players. So I was trying to, I said, now well, I don't know how I could break this up. I didn't break it up, but I got more used to it because during the summer, every little league team had their opening of their season. They would invite me to come to throw out the ball, meet the kids and all of that. But when I went to a lot of those places, the kids thought I was white because of my name. They didn't, they didn't know. Just because of the name Ernie Banks? Yeah. <laughs> I would, I would and and what, what was the reaction when you would show up in, in, yeah, in these look, situations? They would look at me and they would start talking. <laughs> oh, I thought he was white. He's black. <laughs> So I'd come out to the field, or go in the locker room, or the gym, or somewhere they were, and they saw me. But a lot of them didn't believe that I was black, because they didn't know. They heard my name, but they didn't know. So I just learned how to get along with kids. That's how I got some experience in communicating with white players, and the managers, and coaches, and all of that. And uh, it was a learning process from those kids, and I learned a lot from them. When did you start to feel like you finally fit in off the field and on with the Cubs? Never felt that way. Really? Never. Throughout your entire career? Never felt that way. I never felt that way. When I went in the Hall of Fame, that became more realistic to me, you know, in the Hall of Fame. Okay, now the Hall of Fame, I mean, all these players, Babe Ruth and all of them in the Hall of Fame. Now you're in the Hall of Fame, and uh, it's a small community, Cooperstown, small hotel, uh, no blacks in Cooperstown, and you know, you're there, and they're honoring you. And I went in with uh, Ray Shark and uh, another black player who was deceased. And, oh, El Lopez I went in with. So 
I got more familiar with things through that transition from being in the Hall of Fame. So, just so I understand, the man known as Mr. Cub, a man who had 512 home runs, two-time MVP, 11-time All-Star, doesn't feel fully accepted and at home in the world of baseball and the Cubs until the moment you were inducted to the Hall of Fame. Yeah. yeah. And how important of an event was that for you as you think about your life? The Hall of Fame? Yeah. It was, it was very special because uh, it's uh, during the winter, when they called me up and said, you're in the Hall of Fame, <laughs> you know, it was, it was you know, pretty much of a shock. And uh, my mother was with me, and, and uh, my dad was sick at the time in the hospital. Uh, and Lou Boudreaux was with the Cubs, so he kind of got me over and started telling me, oh, you're Hall of Fame now. You got to do this and that and this, and your whole life's going to change. You got to be over here, be over there. Everybody's going to want you to do things. And I just listened to him, and, and uh, he was right because I made a lot of appearances that year. The New York Times wrote me up and said, of the one person who made more appearances than anybody this year was Ernie Bank. I made an appearance almost every night in 1977. But it was a, it was a learning experience for me to go into different organizations, the Bidet Brit, the Rotary Club, all these different organizations around the city speaking what is mostly questions because I didn't know what to talk about. I had no speech. And, uh, and you know, that kind of opened me up and got me in the spirit of, hey, one guy called me and said, you should run for all of them in the Eighth Ward. I didn't know what that meant. But it was, you know, politics. So I did that. I ran for all of them in the Eighth Ward where I lived knocking on the door and this and that, the babies and all of that, and that was, that was an experience. We should point out you didn't win. No, I did not <laughs> win. <laughs> I um, didn't win. So I learned from that. You can win and lose and lose and win. That's Zen, really. It's basically the same. You can win and lose and lose and win. And what I mean by that, that I ran, but I lost that part, but I won on the other side. The winning was to learn more about, you know, the players and the leagues and the teams and the owners. And, and I studied all of that when I was playing, uh, the managers and the dynamics of the game and the psychological part of the game. So one year I went on a cruise. They had cruises for athletes to, to go and meet some of the people on the cruise ship. So I did a cruise. Uh, to Sweden, and uh, I developed a speech for that cruise to speak to the passengers. And the speech was, the economics of professional sports, who's winning? That was the topic to these people, you know, women, men, and all of that. And it was like questions. On the cruise, yeah. On the cruise. Who do you think is winning? Who do you think? I think the fans. I think the agents. I think this. I think that. I think this. I think that. So it's kind of really brought me out into the business side of my life. The entrepreneurship. What is entrepreneurship is all about? It's about the economics of whatever you're doing. And then I got an automobile business. I was the first black Ford dealer in the United States, that was in 69. And to learn more about business, and what I did in the business world was, I hired Pinkerton, that's a, a service that you can hire to do spying on your business while you're away. So I had to hire them. You hired the, the infamous uh, Pinkerton Detective Agency, in That's essence. correct. To, while you were on the road playing or traveling or doing whatever uh, while you were a baseball player and post to, to spy on your own businesses. Yeah, because Mr. <laughs> Mr. Wrigley told me that. If you're in business, you got to check on the check on the checker, especially automobile business. And you cannot trust anyone. I learned that about business then. 
And, and was that a successful strategy to have the Pinkerton Agency? Uh, yeah, yeah, for me, and what I did was I called my partner. I was in partnership with a guy, and I called him up one morning. I told him I'd like to see him at the dealership. He came down, and I went through the service department and showed him all the areas where the technician was taking parts and everything from the dealership. He couldn't believe it. <laughs> and the reason is, I mean, when you play sports, it's hard to, for other folks to believe you know anything. They really don't. If you have a partnership or whatever you do, he don't know anything. But he realized that, oh, God, you know something. You, how do you know about this stuff? I told him, I don't know how I know about it, but you can look and see where these guys are taking all that stuff out of here. Let's um, shift gears and talk for just a minute about something uh, else you know very well about, and that is hitting. Um, this is a segment we call the art of it, where we ask experts to talk about an area of expertise. And in this case, we want to know from you, what is the secret to hitting a major league fastball? A major league fastball. You say it's a secret? Yeah, what's a secret to being a good hitter? For me or for others or for everybody. From your perspective. Don't think. Don't think. Don't think. What do you mean? Once you're in the on-deck circle and you walk up into the batter's box, just hit the ball. Don't think, you know, what they're going to curve ball or this, what pitch going to be this, up, down, this, that. Just get in the batter's box and don't think. Just see the ball and hit it. See the ball and hit it. That's it. That sounds so simple, but yet I can imagine if you're, depending on the situation on the field, uh, the, the, the actual pitcher on the mound, left-handed, right-handed, the kind of pitches he's been throwing, his best stuff versus his weaker stuff, what the count is, who's on base, a lot of variables there you'd have to mm -hmm. you'd think that most hitters are, are taking into account, trying to think about. They do that. I didn't do that. Me, Willie, and Hank, and I talked to them a lot. We played in the National League. I'm a little bit older than Hank. And I used to ask Willie them. Willie Mays and Hank Aaron, yeah, of course. I used to ask them that. Willie, what do you think about when you get in the bat? Man, I don't think. You hit the ball. <laughs> Hank, what do you, I, man, I just hit the ball. But they were different hitters than me. I was a pull hitter. When I came to the Cubs, we had Hank Sauer, he was a pull hitter. It means that he all hit everything to the left field, left, left, left. And, uh, and then I got with Her uh, Ralph Kiner, he was a home run hitter pulled everything to left. So I was a pull hitter, and they felt if you hit the ball the, the opposite field that you were a sissy. <laughs> I only hit two home runs to right field <laughs> in my whole career. I was pulling everything. <laughs> <laughs> left field, left field, left field. And, uh, and that was it. I threw me a fastball outside, I hit it left field. And one day we was playing in spring training against the Dodgers, and, I mean the Braves, and Juan Spahn was pitching. And he threw me a screwball on the outside part of the plate, and I hit a line drive over the left field fast. So the next day he came out and said, what are you doing hitting the ball over there? That pitch was outside. I didn't know what to say to that. But I had quick hands, and my vision was good, and I was more relaxed, and I could do that. You told me if outside fastball, I hit it there. But normally, later on, they begin to change, so a lot of the players hit the ball all to all fields. Hank and Willie hit the ball to all fields. I pull the ball at Wrigley Field all the time. I only hit two home runs at the right field. One at Wrigley Field and one in Philadelphia. <laughs> and I don't know how I did it. That's fascinating. Well, let, let's close this conversation by uh, talking about some some larger, more reflective questions. And I'll start by asking, what's your greatest love in life? Mm. Chasing my footsteps. What do you mean? To win the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> and I was talking to Sidney Poitier, a lot of people came around my life and I would ask them that. 
what does it take to win the Nobel Peace Prize? I asked Sidney that. He said, you've got to have some kind of relationship that you do in Europe. But I didn't have anything. I mean, the diseases and charity things and this and that. I mean, I have anything to get out there to be more known in that part of the world. But that's... But you very much want to win the Nobel Peace Prize. That's right. And, and why is it so important to you? Because uh, I look at all the sports, and, and I used to figure out on every team, every sport, who is the smartest person on the team. You know, there were uh, players like Tom Hayden, Pat Hayden, football player. He won the, uh, he was a Rhodes Scholar. First I looked at Rhodes Scholars. Baseball didn't have any Rhodes Scholars. They had guys that went to Yale and Harvard. They didn't play very long. And I looked at basketball. Basketball had uh, one guy who was a Rhodes Scholar, golf. Bert Yancey was a smart guy, but he wasn't classified as a Rhodes Scholar. I was looking at Rhodes Scholars. You know what a Rhodes Scholar is? Yeah. And then I, and I said, gosh, I mean, what I'd like to do is train some kid, you know, to, that wanted to play baseball to go to MIT and become a scientist and play baseball. I think maybe the Oakland A's had some smart kid. What was his name? He was a Rhodes Scholar and I think he's a pitcher. Name escapes me at the moment. Yeah, I can't. Gotcha. You know? No. But that was my main thing. Yeah. I wanted to I wanted to do that to uplift the image of the of sports. For me, if I couldn't do it, I would get somebody else to, to do that. And the Peace Prize is part of that. Yeah, said, for me. Yeah. Yeah. Road scholars for a lot of the kids that wanted to get into baseball. There's a lot of kids that want to play baseball. What's your biggest regret in life? The biggest regret? Yeah. Is I don't, that's a song about my friend Frank Sinatra. Regrets, I had a few. <laughs> I feel to mention I did what I had to do without resumption. I hunt east of the day. Each day I travel up on the highway. Yeah, I met Frank, you know, many years ago. He was a good friend of Leo DeRocher. And one day we was playing in Palm Springs, and uh, Leo and, and Frank were sitting on the side of the dugout talking. And I was the first player to come out of the locker room. So I walked out of the locker room and they were sitting up there. And I started singing Frank's big song that he had out that year. Strangers in the night, exchanging glances. <laughs> one, and he looked down there and he said, he asked Leo, said, who is that? <laughs> so as I walked up, he got me in a game and I hit two home runs because I wasn't playing that day. Frank Sinatra did. He got you in the game, yeah. in a li on the lineup card. Yeah, I wasn't playing that day. Because he, he asked Leo, he said, who is that down there? And Leo told him. He <laughs> said, I, I want to see him play. That's right. And I, <laughs> I didn't hear him say that, but I hit two home runs in the game. But back to regrets, uh, you're saying that you just don't have many? No. Uh, is, is there one that comes to mind? I mean, it's, I mean I'm always searching. You get knocked down, and get up, knocked down, and get up. And I was always searching my footsteps for that, you know. It was, you know, I mean, and, and playing, I had, had so much joy playing the game that I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to go home. That's why I said, let's play too. <laughs> because I had, it was, it was like when, you, when you're playing baseball, it's like it's on that field, it's like your whole life, it's your world, and, and you don't want to leave it. I didn't want to leave there. And the Wrigley's had an apartment right there in the left field, and I wanted to talk to him about renting the, renting the apartment and live right there at Wrigley Field, but he had that traveling secretary living in that apartment. 
but I didn't want to leave. It was such a joy to be there, to, to, to be able to make decisions on your own, when to swing, when not to swing, when to run, when not to run. Everything that you make in the decision, but when you get away from the field, somebody else is telling you what to do. And that's what happened to athletes. You got a manager, business manager, CPAs, publicists, and all those people. They tell you whether you got to be over here, you got to be over there. But on the field, I felt that this is the only place in the world where I can make my own decisions. You know, it's just playing the game. You have to make decisions. One final question for you. With all that you've accomplished and experienced, what have you learned about life? That um, it's, uh, it's really amazing. It really is. I mean, life is really, really, really amazing. I mean, you, you have parts of it where, where you're a little boy as a player. Campanello said this, to play baseball, you got to be a little boy. I'm a little boy. In, but I'm a little boy to that, and then coming out into the real world, getting married, children, buying a home, cars, college, and you get into the real world, and you say, my God, dealing with people that are not very truthful. That's, that's the hard part I had in my life, is talking to people and they tell me something and it's not true. And sometimes I feel like slapping them, snap out of it, tell me the truth. So it trained me to become an essentialist. I'm an essentialist. I just like to deal with not butter up anything, just that's the way it is. Whatever it is, that's the way it is. Just the one line, not up or down. That's what I became an essentialist, and I'm still trying to adjust to that. Because in the real world, people tell you everything. They get what they want all the time. I'm going to squeeze in this final note. What would it mean for you to see the Cubs win the World Series in your lifetime? Uh, here's what I'm going to do. Tomorrow, I'm going to get Hal Remis, you know who that is? Yeah. To do a DVD, I haven't told him that, I'm telling you. To a DVD of the Cubs winning the World Series. It's going to be for me. <laughs> have him make, produce this. Huh? Have him produce this. Yes, a comedy like he did Caddyshack. Yes. Yeah. And putting all the players that I felt was good enough to help the Cubs win a World Series that were traded and all that, Lou Brock and you know, a lot of players, make a comedy out of it. So in the off season, in my old days before I go into a nursing home, I could put the DV on. <laughs> <laughs> no, wow, no. boy, it's great to be in the World Series. <laughs> But it would mean a lot. I mean, you know, we had a lot of good chances in 84, 87, uh, 2003, and, and, you know, before that, we won 16 pennants, the Cubs did. And uh, we didn't win the World Series. But some things, and I learned from all of that, two things. Some things you think have in, the, have in the bag, and the bag breaks. That's one thing. And the second thing, I learned how to overcome losses. My father died, my mother died. How to overcome losses. I learned this from the two ladies that were lived to be 100. And they did the documentary on them. I don't know if remember their names. But that was one thing they talked about in, in longevity, is overcoming losses. Because as you get older, you start losing, you know, people that you're around in your life. And all the players that I came up with in 53 are gone. 
you know, you, you, you establish a little bit of relationship with them and you hear about them, you know, they hear about they, you, they died, this one died, that one died, that one died. And like Gene Baker, he was a close friend of mine, taught me a lot about playing the game. And, and you know, when he died over in Iowa, you know, it was, it was hard, you know, to get through that. But through my experiences in baseball, losing, you always think you have tomorrow. Wait until tomorrow, wait until next year. But when you have a loss, a person that has gone, I mean, it's, that's reality, it's gone. My mother died, I mean, I mean, it's, she's gone. But, you know, I learned how to deal with that and the family and all of that and funeral home and picking out this and that and, and, uh, and just remembering the good things that she left in my life and my sister's life. And I got some psychiatrists that I've worked with to work with my sisters because it was very hard on them the loss, because she lived by herself, and my dad died, and so they were very close to her, and I was too. Well, Ernie Banks, I want to thank you very, very much for taking time to come in and talk with us. Congratulations on your latest honor as a legendary landmark in Illinois, and mm -hmm. uh, thanks for all you've done for the game, uh, for Chicago, and for us. We appreciate it. Great talking with you. The best is yet to come. <laughs> the best is yet to come.